So uh, this is the session nine, uh, wireless. Uh, we have three papers uh, in this session. They are about IoT and uh, RoLa te uh, techno technology. And so each, pre each presentation will have uh, 30 minutes, uh, including both a presentation and um, the Q&A. So um, I think uh, when you do the presentation, please show your camera, okay? Um, then maybe the audience can have better interaction with your presentation. So that is the uh, only uh, um, suggestion. Also, um, when you ask question, it's also good to show your camera, I mean, show your face, I mean, in order to have a good interaction. Okay, um, without uh, further delay, let's um, welcome the first uh, author, uh, Ruocheng Liu. So he will present his paper, X5. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear, yeah, no problem. Okay, good afternoon and uh, good morning. Um, this is Rofen. Uh, so I'm going to present our work X5, Cross-Technology IoT Data Collection with Commodity Wi-Fi. So this is joint work with my colleague, Jimen Wen Chao, uh, as well as my advisor, Tian He. So the IoT market are growing really fast. At the same time, we have seen multiple emerging wireless techniques that are used by these IoT devices. And the uh, two famous IoT protocols are Zigbee and Aurora. And therefore, uh, connecting these IoT devices to our mobile devices can inspire a lot of interesting applications. For example, if we can collect the IoT data using our mobile phones, uh, there will be several benefits. First of all, uh, our mobile phone has a really big screen, whereas the IoT devices typically do not even have a screen. So using mobile phone to display the IoT data, the smartphone can be a very convenient user interface for user to visualize IoT data and interact with uh, IoT devices. Furthermore, uh, mobile devices usually also have a very powerful CPU. Uh, in contrast, uh, IoT devices are typically limited in computation resource. So mobile devices can be a good platform for IoT data to do sensor fusions and uh, machine learning operation. And finally, smartphone has a ubiquitous connectivity to 5G or IoT base station. So it can also act as an IoT gateway to push the IoT data to the cloud. However, due to a limitation in size and complexity, uh, mobile devices such as smartphones only provide a very limited choice of wireless interface. So they are mostly incompatible with this emerging IoT technology like ZB and Aurora. So as a result, we cannot use our smartphone to, to directly fetch data from these heterogeneous IoT devices. So historically, there was uh, something like a Zigbee enables SD card. But you know, nowadays, almost no mobile phones support IoT, uh, support the SD card interface anymore. Also, there's some uh, smartphone manufacturers like Samsung which try to embed Zigbee radio into smartphone, but all of these solutions uh, are not widely adopted. So in this, in this paper, we study a possibility for cross-technology data, data collection. So in specific, we want to study if the mobile devices can use their Wi-Fi interface to collect data from Zigbee or Aurora. So by the way, we only focus on 2.4 gigahertz IS band in this paper. And uh, so Zigbee and Aurora are considered here are both uh, the 2.4 gigahertz version. So, and also in, a, in this talk, I will use a Zigbee as an example, but the same idea applies to other IoT techniques. So why this problem is a challenge? Uh, this is because Zigbee and the Wi-Fi has a very dramatic dramatically different uh, physical layer. Um, in specific, Zigbee only have two megahertz bandwidth, which is 10 times smaller than Wi-Fi. 
So theoretically, it is impossible for Zigbee to produce a Wi-Fi signal. So we can compare Zigbee to a low-speed walking person and compare Wi-Fi to a high-speed car. It is impossible for a low-speed person to run as far as a uh, uh, faster as a high-speed car. To, so to address the different in bandwidth, our basic idea is called signal hitchhiking. So sub, in specific, when mobile devices is receiving a downlink packet, the Wi-Fi, uh, the Zigbee radio will send a message simultaneously. So this will create a collision at the mobile devices. And by using this collision, Zigbee data are picked back in the Wi-Fi packet and uh, are able to be captured by mobile devices. So if you go back to our, our previous analogy, then Zigbee signal are, slow, uh, are still a slow working person, but our he signal hitchhiking techniques allow it to hitchhike on high-speed Wi-Fi traffic. And then the next, next question is, how can we obtain the Zigbee data from the received signal? Intuitively, since the received signal is just a summation of the Wi-Fi data and the Zigbee data, then we can just uh, subtract Wi-Fi signal from the total received signal and obtain the Zigbee signal. If we can do so, then we, uh, the problem is just reduced to a, a famous interference cancellation problem that have, have been addressed many years ago. But unfortunately, these previous designs are not applicable in our X5 because all of these techniques require the access to raw IQ signal. So all of the previous work need to have a raw Wi-Fi, a raw Wi-Fi signal in the um, in, in the uh, in an antenna front end. In contrast, uh, commodity Wi-Fi hardware never provide the raw signal to Wi-Fi software. Instead, it will only return a decoded result, which is called a decoded Wi-Fi payroll to the software. And then the problem is that when the Wi-Fi receiver decodes the raw signal into a payload, they, they introduce all kinds of information loss. And thus, our key question is that, how much raw signal can be recovered from the decoded, decoded payload? And are they enough to retrieve Zigbee data? So to fill in the gap between a decoded payload and the raw signal, we have to solve several challenges. But due to the time limitation today, I will just focus on the most interesting one, which is called the error correction. The Wi-Fi packets are protected by channel coding and decoding against the interference. And in signal hitchhiking, the interference is a Zigbee. So Wi-Fi error correction method will try to get rid of the Zigbee signal. And if we get rid of the Zigbee signal, then the payload loses all the information about the Zigbee data. To further demonstrate this, I use a toy example here. So for uh, some Wi-Fi da database, a uh, Wi-Fi channel coder will append uh, some parity bit to increase the redundancy of Wi-Fi packet. When the packet is transmitted uh, in the air, we do signal hitchhiking, meaning that we transmit some Zigbee signal simultaneously such that the Zigbee signal will interference with some Wi-Fi data bit. And our X5 software desire to access this uh, data in order to infer about the Zigbee, infer about the hitchhiking Zigbee signal. So in our case, the interference is very useful. However, the channel decoder uh, do error correction it will try its best to get rid of these errors using the blue part. 
it redounds on the pri um, priority bit. So it, it, it is trying its best to return an error-free packet. But you know, an error-free packet will contain no information about the ZigBee data. Yeah. The key observation to address the problem is as follows. We observe that the channel decoding algorithm or error correction algorithm in commodity Wi-Fi chipset has an error correction capacity, meaning that when the amount of error is within the error capacity, the channel decoder can eliminate all the errors and return error-free Wi-Fi packet. However, when the amount of error is beyond the correct, uh, correction capacity, the channel decoder will be ineffective. By say ineffective, I mean the input of the channel decoder and the uh, output of the channel decoder will be almost the same. So the interference and error in the Wi-Fi packet will be retained uh, even after the error correction. It, this is really important because using this uh, corrupted Wi-Fi data, we can infer about the ZigBee uh, information. So to figure out the capacity, we conduct an empirical experiment with some commodity Wi-Fi chip. And in the experiment, we gradually increase the bit error rate of the Wi-Fi packet. And the packets are decoded by Wi-Fi chipset. And then we examine the uh, bit error rate after the decoding. Uh, by doing this, we can see when the Wi-Fi error correction algorithm will break down. The figure below shows the result. When the error ratio is below 1%, the decoder can crack all the errors. However, if we further increase the amount of error, and when the bit error rate are increased above 5%, only 2% of the error can be corrected. This means that only 2% of the hitchhiking signal are dropped. So we can still use the rest of uh, uh, signal information to infer about the IoT data. And according to our experiment, the Zigbee and Rora signal are sufficient to produce more than 5% of uh, bit error. Based on this key observation, we propose a waveform reconstruction technology. Uh, in which we can reconstruct the raw signal using the corrupted Wi-Fi payload. The first thing we do is that we extract the corruptions from the Wi-Fi packet. And then we map this data into frequency domain, into subcarriers, because Wi-Fi encode data in the frequency domain. And then we are doing a IFFT, inverse Fourier transfer, in order to get the Zigbee signal in a time domain. So this is a re re reconstructed uh, Zigbee signal. We can use the, this reconstructed signal to further infer about the Zigbee data. XY also needs to address other critical challenges. For, for example, how to combat the signal erosion that are introduced by Wi-Fi receivers, how to control Wi-Fi powers in order to you know, capture Zigbee signal, and uh, also how to do time synchronization between Wi-Fi devices and the Zigbee Aurora. So X5 is implemented uh, on commodity Wi-Fi devices. So to illustrate uh, the generality of our observation, we have uh, used a, a Wi-Fi chipset from three different brands. And uh, by the way, we need to slightly modify the Wi-Fi uh, uh, software in order to obtain a corrupted Wi-Fi packet. We also test the X5 with some calls ZB and Rora chipset.
the evaluation result demonstrate that uh, uh, X5 can reconstruct most part of the Zigbee signal, except of some part of the Zigbee signal that has been permanently eliminated by uh, Wi-Fi devices. And we can see from the, the figure above, the reconstructed signal approximates the standard one pretty well. And hence, we can decode this uh, Zigbee signal using some, some Zigbee decoding algorithm and get Zigbee data. So the result shows that X5 can obtain Zigbee data under various scenario. We also demonstrate the generality of our method using RORA. The figure about is the reconstruct RORA signal. And we can clearly see the RORA chip, which can be further decoded to RORA symbol. So finally, I will demonstrate and uh, uh, showcase a demo uh, where we use a wi commodity Wi-Fi chipset to collect some sensor readings from a Zigbee sensor, light sensor. The laptop is equip equipped with a commodity Wi-Fi chipset. And as I hover over the light sensor, you can see the sensor reading change in a Wi-Fi laptop. So let me wrap up on my talk with a conclusion. So X5 is the first cross-technology communication technology uh, that enable communication from narrow band IoT devices to a commodity Wi-Fi chipset. So by the commodity Wi-Fi devices, we mean we don't need to modify the, uh, the hardware of Wi-Fi devices. And then X5 also proposed a general method to reconstruct raw signal from the corruption of Wi-Fi payload. So this is a really general observation that might be used in other uh, cases. And finally, we evaluate, evaluate the X5 with the two representative IoT techniques, uh, that is Zigbee and RORA. And thank you, uh, and uh, I'm open to any questions. Yeah, thank you for the uh, interesting presentation. Is there any questions? Uh... Anyone who want to ask question, just uh, you know, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. This uh, I, I got a question. So this kind of uh, protocol translation work, it's mm -hmm. very much one to one, and developing the such a, a tech, let's say, uh, Rora or Zigbee specific uh, protocol transfer or kind of piggyback. Uh, and you call that uh, what, whatever call it. Signal hitchhiking, yeah, hitchhiking. Yeah. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, for, for me, it's like a dirty check, uh, 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 um, very, uh, yeah, hand-tacked uh, stuff that difficult to be universally used, right? So you have to adapt to this particular wireless channel's particular feature, and then you do this kind of, uh, frequency uh, transformation and uh, uh, reverse. So these, it's, I, I just don't know whether this methodology really is necessary or not. I, I just fear installing one yet a common Wi-Fi interface at the sensor node would be a very generic feature that demanded for the market anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. So and typically, they are also connected. Mm -hmm. Those sensors are anyway connected either with a 
3G infrastructure or another Wi-Fi node or a cable. So there's no need for such sensors to be really use their native uh, ZigBee uh, uh, interface uh, to the outside. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good question. So we, we uh, they also have a USB mm. interface, actually, very much uh, connected with the USB, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yes. So we, we, we can consider some, you know, mobile uh, scenario where there's uh, no gateway for the uh, IoT devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so, so, so your question is a very good question because you, in most uh, static uh, scenario, uh, yeah, yes, the, 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 this uh, IoT devices has already an um, internet connect connection and they can just upload the data to the cloud and uh, the smartphone can, you know, download the data. But, but even, even in that case, uh, in, uh, uploading data to the cloud will increase the latency. So in many cases, we, we want to have a P2P uh, a data connection, the direct connection between different uh, devices. I mean, it, uh, I'm running such a, a, a yeah, sensor connected uh, project and um, our uh, mechanism is basically a, apply a, a kind of edge node which ca can connect with mm -hmm. the node with a USB stick, USB interface. Yeah, and, yeah, yes. And that is a uh, edge device can anyway connect with the outside with, uh, with uh, the mobile phone device or other device so that it has a kind of concentrator. Function. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, that's correct. Transform, transform right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. So, uh, so our, our assumption is that uh, we, uh, we, we don't have such uh, edge devices because uh, uh, employee uh, additional edge devices will add to the cost. And also the, in, the mo uh, in, mo in the mobile devices, we cannot assume that uh, uh, any, any places are covered by, you know, the, those edge devices. So uh, if you want uh, some ubiquitous connectivity, you know, from these IoT devices to, to smartphone, uh, my technology may come in handy. Oh, well, okay, okay, sure. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I uh, okay, uh, um, I agree. Yeah, very good question. I, I got a call. Uh, Glenn Reichert with US Ignite. I think it's very clever. Thank you for the paper. Any other questions? <clears throat> Look, maybe I, I have a, I can have a, uh, you know, um, have a question, maybe can, uh, we can have some discussion on this. Uh, so in this paper, I'm not sure whether you uh, look at the performance of Wi-Fi. So uh, we know that, you know, you can decode the signal, uh, I mean, collect data from IoT device, but how about performance of Wi-Fi network? Uh, will your technology, you know, impact the performance of Wi-Fi? Um, since you know you take uh, you take advantage of this error correction, um, yeah. you know error correction has its capacity. So when the channel is really bad, you know maybe Wi-Fi is a, um, you know has to use all the capacity to correct the um, the error there. So did you do any uh, you know chan channel measurement? Say you know at at the different channel condition, maybe you use different strategy. Yeah, that, that's a good uh, good question. So um, so um, so so we assume that uh, the, the the IoT data like ZB data and Rora data are really sparse. So uh, so we haven't uh, considered a very dense network yet. So for, for very sparse uh, sparse uh, IoT data transmission, uh, our experiment shows that uh, it, it does not uh, um, it, uh, it, it it does not create. A, so uh, it does not reduce the Wi-Fi performance uh, because uh, you know Wi-Fi are really high speed nowadays, and then we only use a very small amount of Wi-Fi packet in order to do signal hitchhiking. Maybe less than one percent of Wi-Fi uh, uh, Wi-Fi traffic, so um, it will not uh, introduce too much uh, errors. But uh, you are correct. If we have a lot of uh, Zigbee and Aurora uh, devices are transmitted simultaneously, and uh, um, especially this Zigbee signal and Aurora signal, they have low speed, so they have a uh, uh, pretty long da data transmission durations. Then there will be a significant significant impact to 
uh, Wi-Fi devices. So this is really a trade-off between you know Wi-Fi and uh, other IoT devices. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. I understand this. Um, I guess I mean I'm very interested in um, some results, like you know, um, in using your method, how many IoT device can support, and at the same time, what is the performance of Wi-Fi? For example, if you say uh, I can support a hundred IoT device, my Wi-Fi reduce one percent. Or I can support a, hand, a, a thousand IoT device. My Wi-Fi reduce maybe two percent. I really look. I mean, I really interesting in this kind of trade-off. I mean, if you can, maybe it's uh, like future. future. I, I, I yeah, yeah. I will leave that in the future. Okay, this is a really interesting in the research topic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Tao. Yeah. You're uh, welcome. Hi, Rosen. I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so in your work, uh, you transmit the data from the Zigbee and the Aurora to the Wi-Fi, right? Uh, but yes. how about uh, if the you send the instructions or something from the Wi-Fi to Zigbee node or to Aurora? Oh yes. So 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 the the question is uh, basically how to achieve a bi bi bidirectional communication, right? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, Wi-Fi. Yes. So, so um, yes, that's an interesting question. So uh, the communication from Wi-Fi to Zigbee Aurora has been well studied for many years. Um, um, so this, they are less challenging than our uh, problem because Wi-Fi has a large bandwidth, like 20 megahertz bandwidth. So it, uh, it is pretty easy for Wi-Fi devices to produce a Zigbee signal. So there's uh, several previous work that have Showcase that uh, um, by choosing some uh, elaborately designed uh, Wi-Fi data, then the Wi-Fi packet uh, can look similar to a Zigbee packet. Oh, so okay. yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so so currently we have uh, in, uh, implemented uh, uh, Wi-Fi to Zigbee, Wi-Fi to Aurora to Bluetooth communication, and they are really robust. Also, um, in my work, I, I also need to use such a you know. Uh, Tech previous technology in order to do time synchronization from Zigbee and uh, Wi-Fi. You know, for example, uh, why Zigbee need to know when to transmit. Uh, yes, so 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 Wi-Fi need to send the instruction to these different IoT devices. Uh, but but due to the limitation of this talk, so uh, I I gross over these details. But uh, oh, you can okay. see uh, uh, look at uh, my paper to see these uh, details. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Oh, uh, hi. Hi, uh, this is Moshe from SUNY Binghamton. So, uh, thanks for your next talk. And uh, so what, what is the maximum actually link distance uh, and throughput of your CC link? Okay, that, that's a, yeah, yeah, excellent question. Uh, so the, one of the key uh, limitation of uh, this kind of uh, technology is uh, communication distance. You know, because we are using interference as a way to communication. So to and to to generate interference, uh, usually the uh, IoT, IoT devices need to be a, a bit closer to the uh, Wi-Fi receiver, because they are they are low power devices and they have a very limited limited transmission power. So if if it is above maybe uh, according to our experiment, if the Zigbee or Aurora devices is beyond 20 meter uh, from the Wi-Fi devices, it will create a very small amount of error. And uh, because of my technology using error to infer about Zigbee data, so so if there's only a very small amount of error, then the, the default Wi-Fi wi you know Wi-Fi error correction mechanism we can get rid of all the errors. And then it will return an error-free Wi-Fi packet. So in that case, we will not be able to get any data. So uh, according to our experiment, uh, this kind of technology works very, very well when the distance is uh, within 10, you know, 10 meters. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 within 10 meters. Yeah, very, very good questions. So how about the group pool? So maybe from Zigbee to Wi-Fi or Laura to Wi-Fi, so... What's the maximum throughput? Yeah, uh, the maximum uh, throughput uh, is uh, uh, 
if I remember correctly, is a, a, a is a about about a hundred kbps because we we use actual coding to protect the data. Okay, one hundred k. Yeah. 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 We, we use some hamming code to protect data. So again, this is uh, some limitation of Wi-Fi devices. So when Wi-Fi devices uh, decoding, it will eliminate some, you know, some some part of the signal. So there's no way to retrieve those data. So at the end of the day, we still need to do some coding, do some hamming coding in order to increase the uh, redundancy of the, the data. So yeah, there, there's some, uh, some loss in your throughput. But for RORA, it's better because RORA is a, has a really long chip, a, lot, a long chip. So, so uh, even we, if we lose some information, we can recover the RORA, RORA data. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all this, uh, you know, really uh, good presentation and uh, very uh, interactive, uh, you know, the Q&A session. So any other questions? Okay, uh, if there's no more question, uh, let's thank for the speaker uh, and uh, uh, and welcome the next one. Thank you very much. Yes, for thank the you for the audience. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, you're welcome. So our next speaker is uh, Dimu uh, from uh, SUNY Binghamton. So uh, yeah, you can start. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Dimu. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science at the State University of New York at Binghamton. Today, I'm going to present our work, Runtime Control of Lara's Braiding Factor for Campus Shuttle Monitoring. I collaborate with my advisor, Dr. Mo Sha, and my colleagues, Yitian Chen and Junyang Shi on this research project. Sorry, one second. The goal of our project is to build a low-cost system for data collection from six shuttles that circle our university campus in order to enhance the safety and efficiency of the shuttle service. Our campus shuttles run on a fixed route within a 1,280 meters by 990 meters area. This photo shows the route. Runtime measurements are collected from these shuttles to, to enhance the safety and efficiency of the shuttle service. For example, the real-time measured vehicle speed can be used to estimate the expected time of arrival at the shuttle stops. The, the number of passengers can be used to monitor the transit demand, which allows more shuttles to be dispatched when needed. Warnings or alarms can be issued when the system detects an abnormal condition. The collected data can be separated into two categories, time-critical data and non-time-critical data. The time-critical data, such as the current vehicle speed and the number of passengers, must be collected in a real-time fashion because the data may become useless if it fails to be delivered in time. The non-time-critical data, such as the data reflecting the vehicle's engine and braking performance, can be delayed because the vehicle condition does not change very fast. Today, there are several wireless technologies readily available for us to build the data collection system, such as Wi-Fi, satellite communication, cellular network, and LoRa. We first consider Wi-Fi. The cost will be low if we could leverage our campus Wi-Fi infrastructure to build the system. However, Wi-Fi provides short link distance we identified many Wi-Fi dead spots along the bus route. It is not cost effective to deploy a lot of new Wi-Fi access points to enhance the coverage in the outdoors. We also consider satellite communication, which can provide long distance links that can connect the shuttles to our base station. However, the cost is high. Satellite systems require expensive devices and monthly service fee. Similar to satellite communication, cellular networks such as 4G LTE also suffer high cost. As an emerging technology, LoRa is a low cost alternative that supports long distance data collection. LoRa stands for long range, which is a low power wide area network technology. 
Many inexpensive commercial of the shelf LoRa devices are readily available today. Moreover, LoRa radios operate on the free ISM bands. LoRa provides long distance wireless links. A, LoRa, a single LoRa base station can cover our entire university campus. LoRa is designed to be low power. Battery powered wireless modules can easily and inexpensively retrofit the existing sensors on the shuttles without the need to run cables for power. With these three reasons, we decide to build our system based on LoRa technology. Our system consists of a set of inexpensive commercial of the shelf devices. We build a star network with a single LoRa base station and multiple LoRa end devices. An embedded computer, Raspberry Pi 3 Model B, integrated with an IC980A LoRa gateway module serves as our base station. The IC980A LoRa gateway module can receive data from eight channels simultaneously. So each shuttle in our system can have a dedicated channel for communication. The Raspberry Pi and the LoRa gateway module are placed in a weatherproof box on the roof of our three floor building in the central area of our campus. The LoR end device is a Raspberry Pi integrated with an RN2903 module. The 2903 module only operates on a single channel, but it's much cheaper than the gateway module. The LoR end device is put in the glove compartment of each shuttle. The total hardware cost of our system is only 536 US dollars. We encountered a challenge when we configured our LoRa devices. The spreading factor, short for SF, is a physical layer parameter that determines the duration of a data symbol. There exist six possible values for SF, SF7 to SF12. We must make a trade-off between the link reliability and throughput when we configure the SF. Theoretically speaking, the maximum data rate of a lower link is proportional to the SF divided by two to the power of SF, which, which decreases exponentially when the SF increases. The required signal to noise ratio to successfully decode a packet is, dec is decreased by 2.5 dB for each time that the SF is increased by one. The smallest SF value, SF7, provides the highest throughput, but the shortest link distance. If we use SF7, we cannot use a single base station to cover our university campus. The largest SF value, SF12, provides good coverage but the lowest distance, uh, I mean the lowest throughput. The maximum throughput when using SF12 is only 300 bit per second, which is not enough for our application. To understand the impact of SF configuration on network performance, we have performed an empirical study that configures the LoR and the devices to use all SF values in a round robin fashion and let the LoRa base station measure the network performance. We have collected more than 3.18 million measurements during the shuttle's real-world operations over 40 months. This box plot presents a trade-off between the link reliability and throughput when the LoRa devices use different SF configurations. The left figure shows a packet delivery ratio, PDR, measured under different SF configuration. The median PDR increases from 0.38 to 0.94 when the SF increases from 7 to 12. The right figure shows the link throughput. The median throughput decreases from 1.05 to 0.14 kbps when the SF increases from 7 to 12. The result clearly show that the PDR increases and the throughput decreases when the LoRa transmitter uses a larger SF value. More importantly, the link reliability increases more significantly when the LoRa transmitter uses larger SFs, while the link throughput decreases dramatically at smaller SFs. 
these observations motivate our design on the SF selections. Our empirical study also investigates the ineffectiveness of the existing SF selection method, including adaptive data rate, ADR, which is specified in LoRaWAN. ADR is an algorithm that selects SF based on link quality measurements. Specifically, ADR first estimates the link quality using the SNR measurements and then select SF based on the required SNR levels. ADR has been used in many stationary, stationary LoRa deployments. These two figures present a data trace collected when a shuttle circled our university campus twice and used ADR to select SF values. We deploy a GPS device on that shuttle to measure the location in order to calculate the link distance. The left figure plots the distance between the shuttle and the base station and the SNR values measured at the lower base station. The x-axis is a time from zero to 2000 seconds. The blue dashed curve shows the link distance and the orange curve shows the SNR measurements. The gray regions mark the time periods when the shuttle parked at the stops. We can observe that the first, third, and fifth stops are close to the lower base station, while the second and fourth stops are far away. The SNR our values are small when the LoRa device is far away, as expected. The right figure plots the SF values selected by ADR and the resulting PDR over time. The blue dots show the SF values selected by ADR, and the orange dashed curves shows the resulting PDR. The ADR is designed to provide good PDRs by adapting SF at runtime. From the right figure, we can see ADR is effective in selecting good SF values when the shuttle parks at the stops, resulting in high PDRs in those gray regions. However, the PDR drops significantly when the shuttle starts to move. The result clearly shows that ADR, which is designed for stationary devices, does not work well on the mobile lower end devices. To address this problem, we develop a new runtime SF control solution. Our design goals are to meet the link reliability requirement specified by the application and maximize the data collection throughput. Meeting the reliability requirement has a higher priority because the system must deliver the time critical data in time. Our runtime SF control solution takes three types of data as input. The runtime wireless link quality measurements, uh, the reliability requirements specified by the application, and an initial data set. Our solution defines two periods, the initialization period and the operation period. The initialization period starts when the system begins to operate. Our operation, our uh, solution first creates the initial data set by controlling the lower end devices to transmit packets using all SF configurations in a round robin fashion. The, uh, um, the lower base station measures the link quality and records the received and missing packets under each SF configuration. After collecting enough data, the system enters the operation period. The SF selector begins to periodically predict the best suited SF configuration based on the current link quality and the current reliability requirement. The SF selector employs a k-nearest neighbors KNN algorithm and makes SF decisions based on the wireless link quality measurements, the reliability requirement, and the initial data set. The SF selection process includes three steps. First, it searches for key data points in the initial data set, which are most similar to the current link reliability, I mean, the current link quality measurements. Second, it predicts the success or failure of packet delivery under each SF based on the voting among the key data points. Finally, it selects the smallest SF, which is 
predicted to be able to provide a successful packet delivery. This design is to maximize the throughput. The voting threshold is a parameter used by the KN algorithm. It is defined as the required ratio of data points that vote positive when predicting a successful packet delivery. A higher threshold leads to fewer false positives and a higher link reliability. Our SF control solution adjusts the voting threshold and write time to ensure that the link can always meet, meet the reliability requirement. The adjustments are triggered when a new link reliability uh, measurement is uh, available or the link reliability requirement is changed. These figures show the architecture of the software that runs on our uh, lower base station and the lower end device. Our runtime SF control solution is implemented as the SF selection engine that runs on the lower base station. The packet controller, I mean the packet collector forwards the received packets from the lower physical layer to the uh, application and collects the link quality measurements for the SF selection engine. The network management packet generator broadcasts the network management packets, which carry the selected SF configuration, the assigned channel, and the transmission schedule for each end device. On the uh, each lower end device, the command interpreter interprets the network commands from the received network management packets. The transmission controller transmits the data generated from the vehicle on the assigned channel using the selected SF value. The data buffer maintains two data queues for data collected from the vehicle, a high priority queue or edge queue for time critical data and a low priority queue or L queue for non-time critical data. The transmission controller only transmits the data stored in LQ when the HQ is empty. We have performed a series of experiments to evaluate our lower based data collection system. Our runtime SF control solution relies on an initial data set to predict the SF. In the initialization period, the lower links may experience degraded performance. Therefore, it is important to investigate how much data our solution needs to collect before it can make good decisions. This figure shows the network reliability and throughput when using the initial data set with different sizes. The x-axis is the length of the initialization period in the unit of the number of loops that the shuttle travel around the campus. The y-axis is a network performance normalized to the one using the optimal selections. As the figure shows, the normalized reliability is only 0 0.57 when the length of the initialization period is one fourth of the loop. The low reliability indicates that using the data collected in the one fourth of the loop is not enough to provide good SF predictions. When the initialization period includes the data collected for half of the loop, uh, the normalized reliability increases to 0 0.91, but uh, the normalized throughput is low, only 0 0.72. The normalized reliability increases to 0 0.92, and the normalized throughput increases to 0 0.87 when the initialization period includes an entire loop. More importantly, this figure showed that uh, a, longer, um, a longer initialization period cannot provide much help on improving the throughput and the reliability. So one loop of initial data is enough for our SF selector to make, to make a good predictions and the selections for the SF. To further reduce the initialization overhead, we also investigate whether we can share the initial data set among different shuttles. This figure plots the reliability and throughput when we use the initial data collected from shuttle BCDEF on shuttle A. The x-axis the is the shuttle ID where we collect the initial data set. 
the y-axis is a performance normalized to the regular condition that the shadow A uses the initial data set collected from itself. As the figure shows, the normalized reliability ranges from 0 0.98 to 0 0.99 when using the initial, data the initial data collected from the other shuttles on shuttle A, while the normalized throughput ranges from 0 0.96 to 0 0.99. The results show that it is feasible to share the initial data set among different shuttles, which can significantly reduce the initialization overhead. We also compare our, uh, our SF control solution against the three baselines. The ADR plus selects SF based on the measured signal to noise ratio. Probing selects SF based on the measured packet reception ratio. A GPS based method uses GPS coordinates to select SF values. These two figures plot the comparisons among four solutions all results are normalized to the optimal values. The left figure shows the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the normalized throughput. Our solution provides the best performance with the, the median normalized throughput of 0.92. The median normalized throughput is 0 0.58, 0 0.57, and 0 0.86 when using ADR+, probing, and the GPS-based method, respectively. The red figure shows the CDF of the normalized PDR. Our solution also provides the best performance. The median normalized PDR is 0 0.66, 0 0.69, 0 0.89, and 0 0.93 when using ADR plus, probing, GPS based, and our solution respectively. Our runtime SF control solution consistently outperforms these three baselines. The results show uh, the result also, also indicate that using the link reliability and link quality measurements is enough to select good SF uh, configurations. So there is no need to install GPS devices. In conclusion, we present a system that consists of low cost commercial of the shelf devices and collect data from six shuttles that circle our university campus using LoRa links. Our empirical study shows the trade-off between the reliability and throughput when selecting SF for mobile, uh, uh, mobile uh, lower energy devices and the ineffectiveness of the existing SF selection methods. We introduce a lightweight KN-based uh, solution that selects SF at runtime to meet the reliability and requirement um, specified by the application and maximize the link throughput. Thank you for your attention. Yep. Uh, thank you for the uh, very good presentation and very interesting work. Uh, any questions? If you have any question, just uh, you can mute yourself and uh, just you can ask. Um, okay, maybe I can start with a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, I think this is a very solid uh, system implementation and very interesting work. Um, I want to know that, you know, um, for the, for the, um, for the device on the bus, the shuttle bus, mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you have, um, um, that's Raspberry Pi, right? You have Raspberry yes. Pi on it. So yes. then what's the power consumption, the whole power consumption of the system? Like you say, you collect uh, about three, more than 3 million results and uh, yes. over 40 months. I just yes. wonder how many times you change the battery. I mean, what kind of power supply you use? Uh, yeah, actually we um, we powered our um, lower end devices on the shuttles using the uh, the power from the, the shuttle. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is um, like a 12 volt to five volt converter connected to the, the you know, car battery. So. Um, there is actually uh, infinite amount of power uh, we can uh, draw from the bus. But uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, the power consumption is um, around, uh, I think, uh, 
um, um, about um, one watt uh, or uh, one one thousand or uh, one thousand and two hundred uh, milliwatts, uh, including the Raspberry Pi and uh, the uh, LoRa device for the LoRa N device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is just a prototype. Um, for further implementation, there are um, we can actually get rid of the Raspberry Pi and use more power efficient um, low power sensors and the controllers to control the lower module. Mm -hmm. Yeah, based on the application demand. Yeah, yeah, yeah very good. So uh, how about this uh, KN? You ran the KN algorithm. So uh, is it uh, complex? Uh, I mean, is it, uh, um, you know, compute intensive uh, algorithm or it just a very lightweight? You mentioned it's a lightweight, right? Mm, say again, please. I mean, uh, you use KN algorithm mm -hmm. to, you know, process the data. So mm -hmm. uh, what kind of complexity of this uh, KN? Oh, the, com the time complexity. Yeah, yeah, actually, can I show some um, extra result? Because uh, yeah. I have yeah. um, some, um, yeah, extra result for, just for the um, complex time complexity. Actually, yeah. uh, we designed this, KN based algorithm to be lightweight. So to examine the efficiency of our solution, we have measured uh, the time spent on the predicting of the SF values. So we repeated the experiment for uh, uh, 50,000 uh, 50, times on the Raspberry Pi computer. And uh, we draw this CDF for the time consumption. So over 99% um, of the predictions can be finished uh, within uh, 241 microseconds. So it is very uh, time efficient. It's very mm -hmm. fast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. That's all my questions. So any other questions from the audience? Thank you, actually. Thank you for a good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So any questions? <laughs> yeah. If um, there's no question, maybe let's move on to next uh, speaker. Thank you again, Dee, for your excellent presentation. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So our next speaker is, let me check. Um, yeah, our next speaker is uh, Sizina, uh, Sizina from uh, Wayne State University. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see our screen, no problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Susanna Vamida, and I'm a third year PhD student in the computer science department at Wayne State University. Today, I will be presenting our paper, Long Live LoRa, Prolonging the Lifetime of a LoRa Network. And uh, this is a collaborative work from our lab, Embedded System Lab in, at Wayne State University with the authors Venkata P. Modekurti, Mabur Rahman, and our advisor, Abzaid Saifullah, and Marco Bracanelli. And uh, since then, one of my colleagues has joined the CUNY Queens College, as you can see in the slide here. So let's begin the presentation. So I will begin with some introduction to Laura. So Laura is a low power wide area network or LP1 technology, which can power numerous, uh, which can connect numerous low power devices over a very long range at a very low data rate. A single LoRa network is equipped to support thousands of end devices and these devices are in direct connection with the gateway. Thus, it is a very suitable technology for Internet of Things applications such as a smart city, smart agriculture, environmental monitoring, wildlife monitoring, and so on. So in the figure here, we can see two IoT applications that can leverage LoRa. The top one is showing a smart city and the bottom figure is showing a smart agriculture application. Now, most of the end devices in LoRa networks are powered by single-used batteries, single-use batteries. And uh, which is, uh, which has several disadvantages. Uh, first of all, it's uh, very costly at these uh, large scales, and it requires periodic maintenance. Also, uh, these batteries leave a very high carbon footprint. 
So recently, we are seeing the emergence of um, green energy sources as a sustainable alternative to single use batteries. And these energy harvesting power sources and are, very, are suitable for long-term deployment and they leave a very low carbon footprint and are thus environment friendly. However, the use of energy harvesting power sources in a large network raises the some challenges such as heterogeneous state of charge at end devices and this can be the this can be caused by uh, weather conditions or shadows and so on so the problem now becomes how do we maintain the network maintain or maximize the network lifetime of a large network that is powered through energy harvesting power sources and that is a problem that we are considering in this paper so now let's look at our system model. We consider a LoRa network with numerous end devices and or sensor nodes. And each end device is connected to a rechargeable battery that is recharged via a lo local green energy source. And these devices are um, directly connected to the gateway. Usually the instantaneous power generated by a green energy source varies over time. However, the total amount of energy generated or repeats after a fixed time interval. And we call this interval the recharge cycle for each node. Now, and the, we assume that the network server or the gateway can uh, estimate the amount of energy generated in its recharge cycle. And we call this the battery budget for each node. The gateways in our model are line powered and we also assume that there is a known minimum interarrival time between the packets generated at the devices. We, we assume that the location of the nodes in the network are known to the gateway via some localization methods. Now let's look at the problem that we are considering in this paper. In the figure here, we show two devices, node U and node V. Now, node U has not generated enough energy in its last recharge cycle, and node V has generated more than enough energy to send all of its packets successfully to the gateway. So we call the nodes which do not have sufficient energy to send all of their packets to the gateway a depleting node, and the nodes who have more than enough energy to send all of their packets to the gateway are called affluent nodes. Now, during network operation, node U, after sending 80% of its packet, drains its batteries. On the other hand, node V is, successfully, is able to successfully send all of its packet to the gateway and still has energy to spare. So the data collection from node U is hampered when, because 20% of its packets never make it to the gateway. Thus, it, it, this can lead to an application requirement not being met. So we considered the definition of network lifetime as the time interval at least until at least at, uh, one node has depleted its battery budget. We considered this uh, definition because it hampers the application requirement. It hampers the application requirement of uh, the network. Next, we will look at some related work in this field. Recently, there has been an increased attention for research in LoRa. There are several works uh, published in ICNP 2019 by Wang et al. and in SICOM 2017 by Eletrbi et al. that look into approaches that try to enhance uh, various, various network metrics, such as uh, throughput latency and reliability of a LoRa network. And the work uh, proposed by Gao et al. in ICDCS 2019 studies the energy efficiency of a LoRa network. They provide a general strategy for all nodes. However, we would like to point out that this is not effective in lifetime maximization of an energy harvesting LoRa network. Uh, 
because a depleting node that has not generated enough energy in its last recharge cycle will still drain its battery pretty rapidly, even with the most energy efficient configuration. And this, our approach that we present in this paper is to prevent the depletion of battery budget of these nodes. And we propose a link layer protocol to achieve so. Our approach called long-lived LoRa dynamically enables depleting nodes to use the residual energy of affluent nodes. Let, now let's look at how do we achieve that. So our idea is called packet offloading. So if you look at the figure here, node U, which was a depleting node, and node V, which was an affluent node, both are sending packets to the gateway. But after sending 60% of its packet, node U stops sending packet to the gateway and sends its packets to node V instead. So, and node V delivers this, the rest of node U's packets to the gateway on node U's behalf. So we call this a uh, transfer of responsibility from for packet delivery from node U to node V, the packet offloading from node U to V. So in this, uh, during packet offloading, the total energy consumption at node V has increased, but this, is, this does not hamper the network lifetime as long as we only utilize the residual energy at node V. Thus, this approach does, while it, this approach seems counterintuitive because we are increasing the energy consumption of node V, this is effective in prolonging the network lifetime. So what are the challenges that, and what are the challenges in enabling packet offloading? There are three main challenges. Usually node-to-node -node communication requires synchronization strong time synchronization between nodes, which is undesirable. And in LoRa, we also have to align several other transmission parameters to enable packet offloading. And finally, we have to dynamically select affluent and depleting nodes in the network to prevent the affluent nodes budget to be depleted. Our approach called long Live LoRa is a lightweight Mac which avoids node time synchronization and it selects energy efficient parameters for offloading. And we also provide a heuristic algorithm for selecting affluent and depleting nodes in the network. And this is done based on extensive energy overhead analysis. So now let's look deeper into our approach. So we have three modes of operation for nodes, offloading, lading, and conventional. In, an, in offloading mode, and depleting node offloads packet to a nearby affluent node. In lading mode, an affluent node receives packets from a depleting node and forwards the packet to the gateway. In conventional mode, the, the nodes directly send packets to the gateway. We will now look at our different modes and see how they enable peer-to-peer -peer communication. So in, an, in, in a lading mode, an affluent node adopts carrier activity detection or CAD. In CAD, the node receives signals for two symbols and then probes for correlation between this received two symbols and a known preamble. And if a packet is detected, the node continues to listen to the medium. Otherwise, it stays in low power idle mode. In the figure, we see the timing diagram for CAD where the node sleeps for T1 seconds receives symbols for T symbol seconds. If a symbol is not detected, it stays in low power idle mode for the rest of T2 seconds. However, in the second cat period, when a symbol is, when a packet is successfully de detected, the, nose, no, the node stays awake to receive the rest of the packet. In offloading mode, the nodes only wake up to send packets to the affluent node and the nodes use reverse IQ signal for packet transmission to the affluent nodes node as opposed to regular IQ signals, which is used to transmit packet to the base station or the gateway. This is done to limit, uh, limit the false wake-ups for affluent node during CAD. 
next we look at our transmission parameter selection algorithm our heuristic so lara provides several spreading factors for to effectively control the range and the uh, data rate and the communication uh, over uh, and the transmission energy of a network so in in our uh, in our protocol we reserve the higher spreading factors so, which are spreading factor 9 and 10 for uh, transmission to the gateway this enables long range communication to the gateway on the other hand, we deserve the lower spreading factors, spreading factor seven and eight for packet offloading. This lowers the range of communication, but also provides lower energy consumption. So this is, this, this is effective in enabling low power communication to close by affluent nodes. We consider a location-based segregation of nodes for assigning channels. This is done to ensure the same channel for neighboring affluent and depleting node pairs. And we consider, and we assign the transmission powers based on path loss and receiver sensitivity. Next, we look at uh, the affluent and depleting node selection. The selection of affluent and depleting node is done based on estimated energy consumption in the conventional mode. So if a depleting node is detected, we select aff affluent and depleting node pairs. And this is, and we also uh, calculate the operation time in lading mode or TLM for an affluent node. And, th and this is done based on energy overheads in lading mode, which is called ELM. So now let's look at the energy, now let's look at this energy overhead a deeper, a bit deeper. And so, there are three main components of energy overhead for an affluent node V in lading mode. These are the energy consumption in CAD, the energy consumption in forwarding, use uh, depleting node use packet to the gateway, and then energy consumption for acknowledgement. T if TLM V is the um, lading mode operation time and TCAD is the period for CAD, then the node does TLM V over TCAD times CAD in the leading mode. And thus the first part of the equation gives the energy consumption in CAD. While the second part gives the energy consumption in forwarding. So if for a, in the set of affluent and depleting node pairs A, F, D, N, a pair of nodes U and V where node U is a depleting node and V is an affluent node. And node U is forwarding its packet to node V. And tau U is the period for the depleting node U. Then node V will spend at most gamma into TLM V over tau U times transmissions to forward node U's packet to the gateway. Thus, the second part of the equation gives the energy consumption in forwarding and the energy consumption for, the, for node U for transmission and reception of acknowledgements. Now, there is a slight overestimation in the energy consumption for CAD in this equation because the node does not perform CAD when it's transmitting or receiving acknowledgements. So we account for this over estimation through our energy correction term ECR. Since the optimal pairing for an affluent and depleting node is unknown to us, we use a greedy heuristic based on energy overhead. So the goal for the heuristic or the intuition behind the heuristic is to assist as many depleting nodes as possible without depleting the affluent nodes battery budget. So our heuristic is for every affluent node, we create a pair with all nearby depleting nodes. Then we calculate TLM, which ensures the affluent node remains within the battery budget. And if TLM is too small, we remove the pair with the highest offloading overhead. And we repeat this process until TLM is sufficiently large to support the all, all the assigned pairs. We evaluate our approach through extensive simulations and physical experiments. So first we will look at the simulation setup. We do our simulations in the NS3 module proposed for LoRa 
at, by Magrin et al. in RTJ 2019. We use a single gateway and up to 1,200 nodes. We use eight channels in the US band, 915 megahertz band. Um, in our simulation, most nodes transmit at two to four packets per hour, while some nodes transmit at 20 to 30 packets per hour. And the battery budget for each node was chosen randomly in the range of six to 25 joules. We considered traditional LoRa one as our baseline. And we considered the matrices um, network lifetime and throughput. And our goal was to increase the network lifetime while maintain the same throughput as LoRa. We see the results, simulation results for network lifetime and throughput under varying number of nodes in this slide. And figure A is showing the lifetime in hours over varying number of nodes, while figure B is showing the throughput in byte per second under varying number of nodes. And we see that long-lived LoRa in increases lifetime up to four times than LoRa one while keeping the same throughput. We also do a proof of concept physical experiment in an indoor setup. And unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic at the time of the submission, we could not do large scale outdoor experiments. So we used uh, 15 uh, LoRa nodes, which were Dragino SX1276 LoRa transceiver hat on a Raspberry Pi 3. And each node was running a custom built LMIC 1.6 LoRa 1 library. And the indoor deployment is shown in this figure. It was done in a 30 feet 20, into 20 feet room. And we use a single gateway, which was an RK2245 hat on Raspberry Pi 3. And the gateway used a local chip stack LoRa 1 network server. Our experiments were done on the 915 megahertz frequency band. This figure shows the experiment results and for network lifetime and throughput, the, it, where figure A shows the lifetime in minutes and figure B shows the throughput in byte per second. And we see similar trend as we see in simulation in our experiments also, and where we observe that the lifetime has significantly increased compared to LoRa1, while the throughput is also similar to LoRa1. In conclusion, we have uh, in this paper, we consider an energy harvesting LoRa network in IoT application. In, in these types of networks, the network lifetime is an important metric to maintain the quality of service for applications. In this paper, we propose a link layer protocol to prolong network lifetime. And we propose a packet offloading mechanism, which is counterintuitive, but effective. And our approach was validated by simulations and physical experiments. And we chose that lifetime increased up to four times compared to LoRa1. In the future, we would like to observe, we would like to explore the security issues that can arise during offloading and approaches to solve the security issues. We would also like to uh, work on prolonging the lifetime across multiple rechat cycles. Thank you for your attention, and I would now take any questions happily. Yeah, thank you for the uh, excellent presentation. And any questions from the audience? So, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yes, very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, my question is this, right? So, the uh, the the predecessor of this IoT, which was called uh, Sensor Network. Mm -hmm. So the idea of this uh, life and uh, lifetime maximization in sense network, you know, has been a, has been a, you know, a very extensively studied. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, I, so my question to you is that how this uh, uh, IoT LoRa uh, lifetime maximization is different from the traditional sense network life, uh, lifetime maximization? And thank you. Excellent question. So, and in LoRa, we consider a star network topology where each node is actually connected directly to the gateway. So it's a very long range communication. 
so and, and I, so I think uh, the some of the concepts from the sensor network um, lifetime maximization techniques can still be applied here, but they're not directly ap applicable. So we have to kind of uh, modify it or uh, adapt it for um, these kinds of LP1 uh, networks. So, and, and also in case of LoRa, we have all these uh, additional transmission parameters that we have to align. So that also creates a challenge. So. I, I think what you're saying is completely valid that uh, they can be, I mean, they can be used, but they cannot be directly adapted here as the model is uh, not similar. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I have a question about the, uh, you know, the design. Um, so, in the system, actually, it kind of relay, right? You use a relay to help um, save some energy and extend the lifetime. Um, but what is overhead of this kind of a scheme? Um, and when you talk about the throughput, did, uh, does it include the overhead or, uh, yeah, what's the overhead of the um, term? Excellent question again. So um, in terms of overhead, are you uh, like, uh, what kind of overhead uh, do you mean, like in terms of energy consumption or in terms of uh, like thr throughput? Or yeah, both. It's like, you know, you have to detect, first you have to detect which one, uh, which node is uh, depleting and then you have to schedule, you know, who is the helper, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Exactly. And so in our algorithm is uh, actually centralized. So the network server, the algorithm for selecting the affluent and depleting node is uh, run at the gateway. So which is which we consider as line powered. So we uh, the energy consumption at the gateway, uh, we do not consider it as an overhead. And on the other hand, uh, the communication, like the, uh, once the overhead has, uh, sorry, once the gateway has detected these affluent and depleting node pairs, they, they have to send this information to the gate, uh, to the nodes. So this is done through piggyback acknowledgements. So there is no extra communication for uh, relaying this message to the, or passing this information to the nodes. So in terms of communication or throughput and the, the overhead, I would say is minimal. And that is what we see in the um, experiment results also because the throughput is uh, similar to LoRa one is just that the lifetime has increased. Okay, so uh, when, you see, when you see using server to detect the depleting node, um, I mean, how, how, what kind of uh, detection algorithm you use? It's like a report from the uh, node or you run some statistic algorithm? Then, so it's based on uh, the estimation of, um, energy consumption for in the conventional mode. So uh, the gateway, uh, just uh, what the gateway estimates is how much energy, it, uh, the energy budget this node has and mm -hmm. how much, uh, so it also estimates and retransmission overhead for each node using a very simple sliding window protocol. So, and using, so the node uh, using the, uh, because we using the periods for the nodes. So the nodes have, uh, uh, periods, it can estimate that how many packets this node will send to it, and it will uh, account for retransmission overhead in the in those transmissions and uh, like ca calculate how much energy this node should consume in conventional mode. And compared comparing that with energy budget, it can um, estimate that this node is a depleting node and this node is an affluent node. So yeah, yeah, I understand. So uh, when you see, I mean, uh, when a node is depleting and it will use another node for uh, kind of relay. So in this case, uh, how do you reduce the you know, power consumption of the depleting node? Is it like you reduce the transmission power or what kind of uh, Yes, we reduce the transmission power and the spreading factor. So the spreading okay. factor is lowered. So it, it actually, um, Re reduces the energy consumption uh, for the node quite a lot. So in this case, you have to know the whole topology of the network, right? So that you know, I mean, I mean, the server has to know uh, what is the location of all these uh, nodes so it can select the helper or something like that. Yes, that is an assumption that we make in this paper, yes. Okay, yeah, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Any question from the audience?
Okay, so if there's no question, I think that's all for this session. I mean, let's thank the speakers again, and they are uh, deliver very um, wonderful uh, presentations. And yeah, thank you again. Um, have a nice day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, enjoy your conference. Okay. <laughs>